Well, I'd like to um, talk some about um, theoretical response to some of the experimental um, observations that have been put forward. And a, a lot of things to talk about. I might as well just get into it. Um, the notion of excess energy has been talked about now several times. In the very first, one of the early papers of uh, Fleischmann and Pons, there was uh, data plotted where we saw four megajoules observed uh, increase during 80 hours. If the uh, equivalent size of the palladium cathode were replaced by TNT and detonated, you would have gotten 1.2 kilojoules. Um, the amount of energy we're talking about is really very large uh, relative to chemical energy. What makes this so hard to swallow uh, from a theoretical point of view has to do with conservation of energy and momentum, which is a foundation of uh, nuclear physics, um, basically from the time of Rutherford and the work of uh, one of his students, Darwin. Um, you need to conserve momentum. You need to conserve energy. If you conserve uh, both energy and momentum in a DD fusion reaction, your conclusion is going to be that you're going to get energetic particles coming out uh, a signature of energetic reaction, a, a signature of a nuclear reaction is energetic reaction particles coming out, which is a direct consequence of, of um, energy and momentum uh, conservation. Uh, an example of that in the case of DD fusion is um, shown here with the neutron and helium-3 coming out. And you can understand if the um, two deuterons have very little energy, kinetic energy coming in relative to the energy produced, then the amount of uh, energy that each product has is determined by conservation simultaneously of energy and momentum. Um, in the Fleischmann and Pons experiment, the four megajoules that uh, is produced seems to be produced without commensurate energetic nuclear products. Um, an early uh, photograph here shows Pons and Fleischmann and I think Hawkins along with the experiment and we're not seeing a very large amount of shielding here um, in association with these measurements. Um, other measurements have been done with careful instrumentation looking for energetic products has, has shown no commensurate radiation with these uh, large number of measurements. Nobody's seen energetic particles uh, consistent with the energy produced. There's only two basic pro possibilities associated with this uh, particular observation. And either, A, it's a mistake, and the experimentalists need to go back into the lab. Um, from my perspective, up until about 1992 or 93, um, I thought that was a serious uh, option. And as I learned more about the field and as the results kept coming in, I, I, no, I, I didn't think that any longer, and I surely don't think that now. Uh, the other possibility is that there's a new physical effect that works differently. And um, that's what I've been pursuing, uh, and others have been pursuing in uh, the area of theory. Uh, helium as an ash is particularly important in these experiments. Um, it's been uh, touched on briefly by Ed Storms and, and more by Mike McCubrey. Um, there's helium observed in amounts commensurate with the energy. and um, there's no evidence that suggests that this helium is born with 24 MeV. And in fact, you could make the claim that the, an upper limit, a reasonable upper limit that could be extracted from the experimental measurements is, is uh, an energy less than 20 keV. And that's actually consistent with a similar upper limit that was established by Kevin Wolf in the case of tritium. The absence of, of the DT 14 MeV neutron in experiments where tritium was produced um, led Kevin Wolf to put an upper limit of 8 keV on the um, energy that the triton was uh, born with. Um, as Mike said, the helium is um, uh, comes out in the gas stream, but some is retained in the cathode. Uh, there have been so far two experiments where an effort was made to scrub the helium that's produced out of the cathode. And, and one is the M4 cell, which Mike talked about uh, previously. 
uh, illustrated on, on the left here. And the other is the um, laser three experiment, which is the one in the middle here. And uh, in, in both cases, the amount of uh, helium-4 that was uh, detected was commensurate with the energy with a Q value measured to be 24 MeV. Um, in both cases, to within better than 10 percent. And once again, the, the reason that this number is important is it corresponds to the mass difference between two deuterons and uh, helium-4. And if you measure a Q value, um, of 24 MeV in association with the helium, that suggests or implies that perhaps whatever this new physical process involves, it involves two deuterons coming in, uh, helium-4 coming out, um, 24 MeV reaction energy being made, but not coming out as energetic particles. So this is the, the box that uh, Mike McCoubrey was, was um, re referring to. So the, the question mark is this new physical process that's uh, responsible for this. This sets up the theoretical problem. And the theoretical problem, if this is going to happen, you've got 24 MeV reaction energy. And uh, basically, that reaction energy has to be split up into a large number of uh, small quanta. Um, the question is, 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 how can you do that as a theoretical problem? One approach to this is to begin by considering the simplest physical system that might be relevant. And um, the system here is a toy system where we've got two level systems with a large energy quanta, and we've got an oscillator with a small energy quanta. The uh, associated Hamiltonian is, is actually a famous one is called the spin boson model. Uh, it was introduced in, I think, 1975 by Cohen Tanuji. Um, and followed on earlier versions that were introduced in the study of NMR processes. Now, if, if you do nothing other than set up a model of this sort and solve it by brute force, which, which I did uh, numerically, I set up a system that had 102 level systems all initialized in the excited state. And I introduced some coupling between them and set up resonant conditions and uh, followed the evolution. And what you see here is the two level systems start out excited, they de-excite, they excite, they de-excite. There's an um, exchange of 17 quanta in this particular case to um, you know, the ratio between delta E, the energy, and the oscillator uh, energy is a um, factor of 17. So here, the number of oscillator quanta increased by 1,700, goes back down, goes back up, goes back down. So this is an example of um, coherent uh, multi-phonon or multi-quantum uh, energy exchange. And this is the basic effect that one would expect uh, would be involved in the fleischmann pons experiment given nothing other than the observation of energy uh, production without uh, energetic particles. It, it needs to work something like this. Unfortunately, our, our toy model has the disadvantage that it, uh, you can only convert something in the neighborhood of 100 quanta if you push the model about as far as, uh, as you can. And 100 quanta is not going to do the job for going from 24 MeV to atomic scale. Um, basically, the effect is too weak. So we need a different model, hopefully related to this model, but one which is stronger. We, we need a version of the spin boson model on steroids. Um, after lots of years working on these kinds of models, I, such a model seem to suggest itself. And um, basically, if you start out with the same model, but you introduce a loss process, uh, not just any loss process, but a very specific loss process, if you basically say that the oscillator uh, has a loss process that works near the transition energy of the two-level system, then you get a new model. And this new model can be expressed with the same terms as the spin boson model, but with an additional term, 
which represents uh, the loss, sort of the kind of loss that I was just discussing. And, and this actually does the trick. Um, one way to understand it has to do with uh, destructive interference. Um, for, for those of you that are um, geeks with respect to quantum mechanics and like to understand things in terms of perturbation theory, uh, in one example, if we want to convert five quanta and we want to go from an initial state to a final state which has one more excitation and five less quanta, there's a large number of ways, pathways, to go from state number one to state number 12. And some of them go up and some of them go down. And as it so happens, they, the contributions from each of the different pathways cancels out to within better than a part per million. It's, it's amazing how that happens. Um, and that's why the effect is relatively weak. However, if you have a loss process such that states with energy that's less than the amount of energy that you started with, well, those states, if you have a decay mechanism of the sort that I described, those states are going to decay rather than making it over here. So all pathways that di dip down here they're not going to contribute, and they're not going to contribute to this um, destructive interference. As a result, the rate from going from here to here increases, and, and increases by, in this example, uh, a factor of a million. And in other examples, increases by much larger factors. So the, the basic issue is that we now have a model that does the job. It can take a big quantum, and it can chop it up into a lot of little quanta, and, um, um, and you can show that, that it can take a 24 MeV quanta, and this mechanism can chop it up into atomic scale quanta. It's strong enough to do that. Um, if we take this kind of model and apply it to the experiments, the very first thing we might say is, well, maybe we're starting out with he deuterium going to helium-4, and um, donating the energy or, or exchanging the energy with a local oscillator mode, a phonon mode. And you can, you can take the toy model and apply it to the system and put in reasonably reasonable atomic parameters or nuclear parameters and lattice parameters, and you can show that it's completely impossible. And the, the reason for it is that the coupling is too weak. And the reason the coupling is too weak is the Coulomb barrier keeps the deuterons apart, and you have a tunneling matrix element that's involved. So we need a new model. And um, one such new model might look like this. So we start out with deuterium and helium-4 and just simply eat the associated very weak coupling. And assume that it's a second system which is going to do this energy exchange process for us. Um, so we've been well, let me go forward and then I'll come back. So we've worked with um, a model Hamiltonian now that has two sets of two-level systems. Linear coupling, loss, and the coupling here is weak. It's got a gamma factor in that takes into account our, um, our tunneling factor. What happens is that um, there's an excitation transfer effect where population here gets transferred by a second order excitation transfer effect to the excited state here. And then this system combined here is just like the lossy spin boson system I talked about, and that can exchange the energy efficiently. So there's two steps, uh, excitation transfer and anomalous energy exchange within this scheme. Um, experiment suggests that D2 and helium-4 are probably the right uh, systems to be relevant to account for the experiment on the left-hand side. Um, the experiment doesn't tell us directly which systems are on the right-hand side. For example, you could have a palladium nucleus in some kind of excited state on the right-hand side. You could have helium-4 and two deuterons up here. If you look at the um, at experiments which haven't been discussed at this meeting. One is a Kasagi three-body experiment. Another is the Letts phonon experiment, which I'll talk about. They, both of those experiments favor starting out with helium-4 and going to 
two deuterons. Um, you, 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 you go from helium-4, you make two deuterons. The two deuterons are made initially close together. They start to come apart. It's not very, um, doesn't, not very much uh, further in time. They come back together and make helium-4. And that process would, would require the two deuterons actually not to ever to get very far apart from one another. So I call that a compact state. And that kind of compact state is exactly what you need to account for the Kasagi experiment. You, you can analyze this model uh, as a toy model, and you can establish um, perturbation theory limits for weak coupling. You can get the strong coupling limits out of the model. You can fire up a computer, and you can get intermediate coupling rates out of the model. And one thing that's interesting is that in the strong coupling limit, you can, you can get um, a, an upper limit, which is supported by the numerical results. Uh, if the coupling on the receiver end is very strong, then you can establish um, a rate in the limit that the excitation transfer is the bottleneck. So this actually gives us a, a reaction rate. And, and if you make some estimates of the uh, strength of the uh, matrix element, which you can do, you get volume factors and gamma factors, and you get a residual nuclear factor, then um, you can estimate this quantitatively. And um, as it turns out, this matrix element calculates out to be roughly in the right neighborhood of what you'd need to, um, to support a model. The detailed calculation, well, uh, this is iconic to indicate that we've done the calculation of how you couple phonons to this kind of reaction. And uh, you've got a state here which has got internal nuclear coordinates, spins, isospins, and phonon amplitudes. You've got a nuclear interaction. And the exchange comes about because the nuclear interaction between two nuclei that are, look different as far as the lattice is concerned. They interact, and they interact in such a way to exchange phonons when a reaction happens. And this formula actually is a perfectly good formula to calculate that quantitatively. Um, we've actually recently begun a program to actually qu calculate it quantitatively. And we're, we started out with a three-body problem because it was simpler than the four-body problem. And uh, the simplest description for a three-nucleon system, um, triton or helium-3, is to have one S state and three D states. We started out just, just for kicks because I wanted to test out some algorithms. We did it in three dimensions. And in this case, this is what the S state of a three-nucleon system looks like with Amata-Johnson potential. So the calculations are underway. but. This is an effort to set up and to grind out the matrix element, at least for one example, uh, in great detail, and have a plant a flag in the ground of having a, a, a solid result. Given this kind of approach, the simplest uh, dynamical or kinetic model, in the sense that Mike McCurbery was talking about for the process, would be expressed in terms of three equations here. You need molecular deuterium. Helium-4 is created, and you make phonons. So all we need, we, we've got an estimate for the uh, coupling rates from the calculations described previously. Uh, you, can as, you can get the um, relaxation rates for the different processes. In the case of helium, it's by diffusion. And uh, the flux creates a source for the phonons. And um, you can evaluate that as well. Um, so the question, first question is, where is the D2? Well, in bulk palladium, the electron uh, Fermi level is fairly high, and uh, the anti-bonding states of D2 get occupied. So there's a lot of papers, 1989, 1990, showing that you can never get bound D2 in bulk uh, palladium. So I'm going to rule out most of the cathode as being relevant for excess heat production. The, um, 
the outer region is far more interesting. And the outer region is interesting because you can make vacancies if you co-deposit. And in the Spock experiment, you co-deposit to get all of your palladium. So you co-deposit and you can make vacancies that way. And what the conjecture is, is that in the, around the vacancies, the electron density is lower, so you can actually make D2. Next question is, which phonon modes? Well, there's some two laser experiments uh, that haven't been described here, but have been talked about at other meetings that Dennis Letts did, where you come in with one red laser and a different red laser tuned to a different frequency. What's observed in these experiments is that if the polarization is uh, right for both lasers, that you get an excess heat response. And the excess heat response depends on the difference between the two frequencies. And the difference between the two frequencies shows up in the terahertz region, which is the region where the optical phonon modes are. So for example, the first one shows up at 8.3 terahertz. If we look at the optical phonon mode spectrum, we see that 8.3 terahertz is the low energy of the optical phonon mode band for palladium deuteride. If we look at the second one, we see 15.3 terahertz. And 15.3 terahertz corresponds to the basically zero group velocity point for palladium deuteride. If we look at the last band, 20 terahertz, we see that that's not on the diagram for palladium deuteride. However, if we looked at the diagram for palladium hydride, we see that the point which is here in palladium deuteride shows up at 20 terahertz in palladium hydride. So at the moment, the conjecture is, is that 20 terahertz response is due to proton contamination in Letts's experiment. So armed with this, we have enough input now to try out the model. So here are representative numbers. And I guess I'm taking 8.3 terahertz one centimeter squared area, a thousand angstroms of vacancy region, which in this case sort of corresponds to Letts's experiments in my view. Um, maximum number of vacancies if you co-deposit high loading is 25%. And you get less than a percent of these things occupied by deuterium if you take the numbers for the di-deuterium um, bonded on palladium and use them in this example. Um, and the reaction rate that seems to be reasonable, the, the bare reaction rate is about one in three hours. In this case, um, he helium diffusion is uh, very fast, so the system relaxes to a steady state. And in this case, you make some helium-4. It's the initial uh, excess power is very low because you don't have helium-4 because you, you need it for the coherent uh, process and it takes a while for the power to get going. And once the excess power starts, it keeps on going and, and it's uh, dogged. And in, in Lasse's experiment, what he finds is once the laser stimulates a mode and the thing turns on, he can turn the laser off and the mode stays on doggedly. In fact, he has to come in with a broom and beat the cathode in order to get it to turn off. Um, the number of phonons, well, the thermal number of phonons is 0.36. Um, you can calculate the amount of phonons produced by the flux using a product of current and, and differential chemical potential. And you, you get a number that's, that's perhaps a few hundred. Um, that gets you above the threshold for allowing energy exchange to happen, which means you get the full reaction rate going. And that full reaction rate produces more phonons. It puts it back into the phonon mode that initiated things. So there's feedback, a little bit like a, a laser um, effect. And that's why the thing can stay on. And that's probably also why heat after life or heat after, heat after death, as, uh, as some people uh, call it, um, would show up. The system would self-sustain and be able to stay on until you um, deplete your, your uh, loading. Another example, and this would sort of, it's uh, 5,000 angstroms instead of 1,000 angstroms, and I've chosen a smaller area. Basically, if you've got a thicker uh, vacancy region, thicker active region, then um, it takes longer for the helium to fuse. So in this case, you accumulate much more. And if you accumulate much more, well, it prevents the D2 from forming. 
So it it throttles the maximum power you can get. And you you get a characteristic shape where it goes up and then it comes back down. And um, you know, there's there's any number of uh, experimental results which shows characteristic uh, excess heat profiles that look like this. Um, probably in the SRI experiments, there's a lot of small regions which go on and behave this way. And uh, they have different current thresholds. So when the current raises above a, a fixed threshold, you get more spots turning on. Um, anyway, we, it's a way to proceed here. Uh, I'm probably not going to have time to talk about all the rest of the things you need to put together a simulation model. I will say that we are working on a simulation model that's going to go from the loading through the formation of the active region on the surface of the cathode model flux and do excess heat and helium diffusion together. Um, to load deuterium, um, D2O comes in, electron transfer occurs, a deuteron goes into the lattice and OD minus comes out. This is the Volmer step. Um, deuterium is lost because deuterium is on the surface. It comes together and makes D2 gas, which leaves this is the Tafel step. You can understand the loading, at least at low current density, basically by, by balancing the electrical current coming in. These experiments are run galvanostatically, which means the current input's controlled. So the loading at the surface is going to be determined by the Tafel outgassing. In fact, you can, you can make quantitative predictions in the low current density region using just this and uh, pretty much understand how the surface works and how the loading in the cathode works. A, um, a, a Grinch in this um, uh, scheme is uh, this fellow, Hirovsky, who suggested that if you have a lot of deuterium at the surface, the deuterium might uh, join on to a D2O to make D2 gas and OD minus. And this happens when your surface uh, um, chemical potential of deuterium is very high. And you can see it in this experiment where when the current density gets higher and higher and higher, um, the chemical potential is high at the surface. And y your incremental current is busy making gas and deloading your cathode. Whereas here in the Vollmer region, Vollmer Tafel region, your current's going, give, carting deuterium into your cathode and helping you. In this region, it's actually uh, hurting your loading. But models for this are, are available in the literature. And these models, uh, they're relatively simple. And you can use them to run a diffusion, you know, loading uh, uh, calculation for your palladium deuteride. Once you've established the surface potential, then you've got uh, diffusion in. And there's some information at, at low concentrations. There's good information about deuterium at higher concentrations. About the only paper that's relevant is one by Baranowski. Um, you need chemical potential models. And you, I've made my own, but there's data in the literature. Um, my hosts are pointing out that, that the hook is going to come out shortly. So I'm going to fast forward uh, to the end and uh, wrap it up here. And the, the wrapping it up is that we have, um, we get energy without energetic particles. We have a mechanism now that can account for that. Um, that mechanism uh, leads us to toy models where the toy models are powerful enough to convert the energy that's required in the Fleisch and Pons experiment. The coupling matrix element's about the right size. Uh, the detailed uh, computation is in progress. Uh, we've gotten some data recently from SRI. We're going to be running our models against. We've, we've started this round al already. We've run the model against some of the degree of loading experiments done at SRI. And the results are very, very interesting. Um, and I guess I'll stop here. Are there any easy questions? Your destruction of the um, negative uh, or the uh, destructive interfering states, 
uh, jumps out at me because um, the interference is, an, is a, a unit phenomenon. The positive, the negative, the constructive, the destructive all go on at once. So my question is, are there any other applications, any other areas of physics where that particular uh, sequence happens, where you destroy the destructively interfering states, uh, you know, quantum entanglement or anything? Uh, my, my colleagues have said that, that there are. Um, I've shown the plot for the removal of destructive interference in the case of energy exchange. For excitation transfer, a similar effect happens, which means in a lossy material, you can exchange transfer uh, uh, excitation much more efficiently in the presence of loss. And and one of my uh, associates at your former laboratory informs me that somebody at your at, at your former laboratory, Naval Research Laboratory, um, ha has observed um, an enhancement in um, uh, Raman conversion. Uh, under the conditions where loss is present. I, I don't know yet whether that is um, uh, uh, relevant to this and whether that's the mechanism. Uh, if it is, it's one practical place where this um, particular effect will be important. Let's see, um, I, I, I don't think you're going to get me to do very much in the way of criticizing Julian Schwinger. I, I was uh, v very impressed that um, he was intrigued by the possibility that phonon exchange might be involved in the flesh and ponds uh, process from a very early time. And his initial models were, I, I would consider them to be exploratory. And if I can. Um, be as competent as Julian Schwinger at the same age that Julian Schwinger was <laughs> when when he did that work, then um, I'll, I'll be doing very well. But no, I, I'm not going to fault Julian Schwinger. No, no, but I just want to mention that this is an improvement. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and I'm sorry that we've had to hasten on because uh, I personally would very much like at some point in the future to see your whole presentation. So, um, We're quite fortunate today to have with us uh, Professor Young Kim from Purdue University. And once again, I'll remind people, you can see the vitas or bios of people on, online. Thank you. <laughs>